Welcome back to the Path to Happiness, an introduction to unification principle. I'm your host, Dr. Tyler Hendricks. In our last session, we came to know the heart of Abraham and Isaac and the price they paid with God to save this world and all its families. This history, history reveals that God has a plan and, the, and that love and oneness with God will always lead to life. But God was not done with Abraham, as we will see, as we look at what happened with Isaac's family in today's session. God led Isaac to marry a special woman, Rebekah, and she gave birth to twins, Esau and Jacob, to build the foundation for the Messiah. In this family, however, Esau and Jacob had to be placed in the divided positions of Cain and Abel, and in that position, fulfill the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature and lay the foundation of substance. Esau and Jacob in Isaac's family were like Cain and Abel in, in Adam's family and Shem and Ham in Noah's family. So they faced a special challenge to overcome hatred and win the victory of love. The explanation is found in Genesis, starting in chapter 25. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to these twins, and they fought even in the womb. What's more, even when they were in the womb, God said that he loved Jacob and hated Esau. He divided them into the positions of Cain and Abel, wherein the elder related to evil and the younger related to goodness. The firstborn, Esau, was red at birth, and his entire body was, a hairy, was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. His younger brother came out grasping Esau's heel with his hand, so he was named Jacob. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Isaac came in from hunting and he was famished. Uh, Esau came in from hunting, he was famished, and Esau asked for some of the stew. And Jacob said he would give it to him in exchange for his birthright. Esau readily agreed, so he valued his birthright as less important than the bread and the pottage of lentils, the food for his hungry stomach. The Bible says that Esau despised his birthright. Thus, Jacob gained the firstborn son position from Esau. In the Old Testament, the birthright of the firstborn son is very important. It's the position of the head of the family he is the one who inherits the father's blessing. He's in charge of all the family's household matters and has also the right to inherit the property. As the years passed, Isaac became old and was almost blind. He was going to die soon, so he decided it was time to give his formal blessing to his eldest son. He was passing on the blessing that he had received from Abraham the blessing that was given by God. He called his firstborn, Esau, and said, Go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare a savory dish for me, such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, so that my soul may bless you before I die. Esau left right away to hunt for some game. Rebekah overheard Isaac's words. And she called Jacob and she said, you should receive the blessing that Esau is going to inherit. And so she told Jacob, go out to the flock and get a good lamb. I will make a good stew so that you can give it to your father and you can receive his blessing. But Jacob worried. He said, I don't have hairy hands like my older brother. And if father finds out, he won't give me a blessing. He's going to curse me. His mother, Rebecca, said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. 
This is how great her love for her son was. She then prepared the food that Isaac loved and took Esau's best clothes and put them on Jacob, covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with goat skins. Then she gave Jacob the food and the bread that she had made and told him to serve his father. Jacob did so, and he went close to his father Isaac, who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So Isaac blessed him with all his heart. He said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and people bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. This is how Jacob, who had purchased the, the position of the firstborn son, became the actual heir and inherited the blessing of the firstborn son. Soon after that, Esau came to Isaac to be blessed, but Isaac could no longer give the firstborn son's blessing to Esau. So Esau wept loudly. He became angry. He determined to kill Jacob after Isaac's funeral. What was Jacob to do? Again, his mother advised him well. Rebekah arranged for Jacob to dwell with her brother, his uncle Laban in Haran, to find a wife and to live there until Esau's anger cooled down. Laban had two daughters, Leah, the older, and Rachel, the younger. So Jacob went to Haran, and of course he fell in love with the younger one, the beautiful and charming Rachel. He told Laban that he would work for seven years to gain Rachel's hand. After the seven years, Laban, who said it, that was fine, deceived Jacob and tricked him into marrying not Rachel, but Leah. Jacob went to his uncle and asked him why he deceived him. And his uncle answered, It's not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. So Jacob then promised to work for another seven years for Rachel. And after a short time, he was able to marry Rachel. Leah gave birth to a lot of sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, four sons, one after the other. However, however, Rachel couldn't conceive. She was so unhappy. Rachel then gave her servant, Bilhah, to be Jacob's concubine and give them a child. Bilhah gave birth to Dan and Naphtali. Leah became jealous and gave her servant, Zilpah, to Jacob as a concubine. So Zilpah then gave birth to more sons, Gad and Asher. Then again, Leah gave birth to sons, Issachar and Zebulun. And Rachel challenged her older sister. She demanded, Jacob, give me a child. And finally, Rachel conceived a child, a son named Joseph. Jacob then offered another seven years of labor. And during those seven years, God blessed him with abundant wealth, many servants and flocks of sheep camels, donkeys, but his heart always was to go back to Canaan to reconcile with his brother Esau. So when the time came, he left Haran for Canaan with his wives, his children, servants, and livestock. Laban discovered Jacob's departure after three days. Rachel took, had taken Laban's idols with her and she hid them from her father. In this way, Jacob triumphed over Satan's world, represented by Haran, after offering 21 years of hard work in his fight to restore the birthright. After winning this victory, Jacob returned to Canaan. Now, on the way, Jacob learned that his brother Esau had organized 400 soldiers and was waiting to attack him. 
Jacob then wisely prepared for meeting his brother Esau. First, he prepared gifts of his servants and his flocks in two groups. He put each type of animal in the care of a servant, and he said to them, he said to them Go tell your, my older brother Esau that they belong to my Lord Esau, a gift from your servant Jacob, and he is coming behind us. So he sent the servants forward with that message. And that night, Jacob wrestled with an angel at the ford of the river Jabbok. The angel broke Jacob's hip bone through that fight, but Jacob would not give up. Daybreak came and the angel had to leave, but Jacob said that he would not let go of the angel unless he blessed him. In the end, the angel blessed him and said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and man and have overcome. From his name, Jacob, which means he who supplants, this name was changed to Israel, which means God's prince, because of his spiritual victory over the angel. So Jacob had first sent his gifts, then he sent his two female servants and their children to Esau, and then Leah and her children to Esau. Lastly, he positioned Rachel and Joseph to come last. Each offered themselves as gifts from Jacob. Finally came Jacob, who bowed down to Esau seven times as he approached him. Now Esau's heart was changed through receiving all these gifts from his brother. His heart was melted. He couldn't attack Jacob. Esau came running to Jacob and he embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him and they both wept. And Jacob said, my Lord Esau, to see your face is to see the face of God. And he introduced his family to Esau and said, If I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. Because seeing your face is like seeing the face of God, now that you have received me favorably. Esau, who meant to kill Jacob, was able to love and welcome his brother in this way, because of Jacob's wise and loving behavior. Because they became united as one, they fulfilled the indemnity condition to remove the fallen nature. Thus, they were able to lay the foundation of substance. Thus, in Abraham's family, the foundation of faith and foundation of substance set the foundation for the Messiah. Why didn't the Messiah come at that time? It was because the family foundation of Jacob's, Esau's, Abraham's family was too small. It was inferior to the power of the surrounding society, which was already centered on Satan and could easily overpower Abraham's family. Therefore, the Messiah could not be able to come until that foundation expanded. In addition, because of Abraham's mistake in the symbolic offering, his sin had to be indemnified by his descendants, who would be 400 years as slaves in Egypt. On the positive side, Jacob's success meant Isaac's success, and Isaac's success meant Abraham's success. So the providence of restoration centered on Abraham although extended to Isaac and Jacob, came to be regarded as having been accomplished in Abraham's own generation without any prolongation. That is why it is written, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This verse indicates that although they were three generations, God regarded them as one generation that was able to accomplish his will. We have learned that the providence of restoration can be achieved only through God's and humankind's portion of responsibility. Because Abraham, as the central figure, 
could not fulfill his portion of responsibility, his mission was extended to Isaac and Jacob. We also learn that even if the smallest mistake in laying the condition of indemnity is made, such as the failure to cut the birds, its restoration requires a greater indemnity condition. Lastly, we also learn that in our life of faith, we also have to put ourselves as an offering and separate the good and evil within. We see principles at work in the courses of biblical figures, creating discernible patterns of events. This helps us understand how God is working in our times and in our lives personally and as families and about the meaning of the Bible. In our next session, we will explain, we will expand our horizon from these ancestral families to the courses of Moses and Jesus. And this will give us a clue as to what to expect at the time of the second coming. Thank you so much for listening, and may God add a blessing to your studies.